There you go. Perfect. Okay. Uh, all right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ted Harris. I am with the Pennsylvania Petroleum Association. I would like to welcome you to our monthly webinar series. We normally do this webinar the first Tuesday of each month at 9 a.m. And it will feature um, a wide range of topics. <coughs> um, a lot of our associate members within the within the organization uh, have the opportunity to present uh, as um, in industry specialists on, again, certain topics. We also bring in um, various state and federal agencies on uh, on anything that's pertinent to our membership on a monthly basis. So um, I think a lot of you that are on this morning have, have joined us in the past. And to anyone that, that's uh, on here for the first time, welcome. Um, before we get started today, uh, we have a really good turnout. Um, everyone that is on the webinar as an attendee, you're going to be on mute. Um, but with that being said, I know this is when you're talking about storage tanks, whether above ground, underground, whatever it may, whatever it may be, there's, there's, there's definitely, there's definitely questions that come up. We certainly from the, from the association perspective, get them a lot. Um, so with that being said, if you do have questions, we encourage you to ask them, but you're going to have, you're going to have to type them into, into go to webinar. There's a, there should be a, you should see a feature, uh, to be able to ask questions. And what we'll do once we get to the end, I will moderate them back to Frank and, um, and hopefully give you an answer. And if, if, if we run out of time or if it's a pretty technical question, what I will do is after the fact, connect you with Frank. And again, hopefully uh, to get you clarity in that regard. So um, we're also going to be recording this. This will be put on to our, our YouTube page um, probably tomorrow. Um, so if you do miss a portion of it or, or want to go back and rewatch it, that will be an option. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Um, okay, so at this point, I want to introduce our presenter today. Uh, we have Frank Catherine, who is the Director of Geological Services for P. Joseph Lehman, Inc., Consulting Engineers. They are a PPA, PPA associate member based out of, I believe, the, the, Al excuse me, the Altoona area. Um, and uh, in addition to that introduction, uh, Frank also serves on uh, BEP's Storage Tank Advisory. Committee, which is also known as Stack, um, he is, and Frank can talk on this more. Um, he is a certain represent. Uh, he has rep representation on that committee, as does the Pennsylvania Petroleum Association. One of our members also serves on that committee, and that's a, essentially a private private public partnership in the way for our industry uh, and other stakeholders to provide feedback to DEP on on various regulations and other happenings within. Uh, with, with, from a regulator, regulatory perspective. So, um, I think Frank's going to touch on that a little bit in more detail. And then, uh, the presentation that Frank is going to cover today is, is understanding under, underground storage tanks in Pennsylvania. So at this point, Frank, I will pass it off to you and, and thank you. Thank you, Ted. Um, and welcome everybody and good morning. Um, yes, we'll be covering underground storage tanks today in Pennsylvania, getting, trying to go through both the regulated and the unregulated versions of uh, storage tanks and uh, kind of cover uh, what's involved with those things. I uh, understand some of you may be dealing more in the unregulated areas or and, and maybe sometimes occasionally with the regulated, but we'll, we'll try to go through that and, and differentiate what's, what's regulated and what's not regulated. Um, and this is who I am. Um, I'm a Pennsylvania certified underground storage tank inspector. I've been uh, doing that since the mid 90s, since they started that at DP. Uh, experience wise, I've actually been pulling tanks and dealing with tanks, either removing them, uh, installing them, also designing for installations uh, since 1989. Um, and as Ted mentioned, I'm also a member of the, the DP Storage Tank Advisory Committee. Uh, I've been a member since uh, 2010 of, of that group. And uh, that, is, that committee is basically was set up to assist with the development of policies in the storage tank area and the implementation of the storage tank and spill program um, that is in the regulations that DP uh, administers. Um, the, the storage tank committee consists of 16 members. 
four of them from the local government, such as uh, county commissioners, town, township supervisors, uh, uh, boroughs. Uh, those are represented. And we, there are five from the regulated community. PPA is also uh, has a seat on that as one of those uh, five. Uh, the Associated Petroleum Institute of Pennsylvania is also a member. Uh, Petroleum Retailers and Auto Repair Association is a member. The Chemical Industry Council also has a representation, and the Tank Installers of Pennsylvania also has a, a member on the committee. There's a member uh, from the Professional Engineer uh, Association or group, which I'm the representative for that. There's also a, a professional geologist that's a hydrogeologist, it's a, a member. There's four from the public, and finally one from a farm owner or operator. So you can see it's a pretty pretty broad uh, basis, and this allows things to be reviewed before they get issued or put out. Uh, I know we went through a lot of, of work with um, the DP on some US EPA regulations that were that were issued and uh, they were finally promulgated in, in 2018 and now they're starting to be uh, you know reviewed and, and uh, used by the regulatory and by the regulated committee. Hey, Frank. Requirements uh, that for regulatory uh, regulated tanks. Then we'll cover the operations of USTs, which basically how they work and what needs to be checked for inspections. A little bit on closure and then some projects that we've done, which are some in the heating oil area, but others, um, you know, that are not, you know, the, the usual pull them and, and have a cleanup kind of di uh, project. So. so we start next here. Go to the next slide. Definition of underground storage tank is basically a tank or a combination of tanks that has at least 10% volume beneath the surface of the ground. So. It doesn't have to be completely buried. It could be partially on the sides, but so I mean, there's there's a couple of different versions. Most of the time, you're probably looking at ones that are completely buried, totally covered with at least a couple feet of feet of fill, and they, um, you know, uh, and they're they're out of sight, they're out of mind. Uh, they're usually installed that way because of size and safety issues, um, as opposed to being installed or put in as an above ground tank. Here's a couple of uh, pictures of a couple of examples of uh, some underground tanks. The ones on the left are steel tanks. Um, they're Act 100s, which basically means uh, they've got some coating on them. Um, they're probably a double wall steel, so there's probably an interstitial in between them uh, to monitor if there's a leak from the inner tank. Ones on the right are the, are, are the fiberglass version, and you see the ribs. A um, little more tricky to install those. Um, Got to make sure that all the, the backfill is tight against those tanks. They're sort of like an eggshell. Um, but if they're installed properly um, and supported properly, you don't have to worry about corrosion with those, and they'll last for a long time. So there's advantages each way with each each type of tank. Now here's a picture, a couple of pictures of some tanks that possibly you might have run across, uh, but they're not considered underground tanks because they are visually observed underneath and around them and they and they're not in contact with the soil so therefore they're considered essentially above ground tanks like you can see the one on the left it just saws on legs it looks pretty new i don't know if it's double wall or not can't really tell the one on the right it has a containment basin dike around it so it's probably a single wall tank but neither of these tanks as far as uh, dp would be concerned would be considered underground they would be above ground tanks in a, in a vault or a basement. All right. Now, the regulated tanks in Pennsylvania, they, they fall under the DP's uh, 
guidance and, and regulation. The, the main things are you've got to have a capacity of at least of 110 gallons. And the second thing is generally the petroleum, it's petroleum substances that are regulated substances that are, uh, that are, that are involved with regulated tanks. Now, there's also non-petroleum things such as biodiesel or some of synthetics, some of oils, uh, and those from, from different kinds of plants. They can be regulated and they would fall under this if they have a capacity of more 110 gallons. But biggest thing is uh, the least, it's got to be a regulated substance. And then the second thing, it's got to have at least a capacity of 110 gallons to be even considered to be a regulated tank. Now, here's probably something you, most of everybody has been experiencing. You fill up a tank, you go to a convenience store. These are the basic components of a, of a tank system. We've got, um, you know, several underground tanks, probably different kind of uh, blends of, of either gasoline, could be diesel, uh, could be kerosene, could even be heating oil. Uh, you've got the tank part of it. You've got the piping going from the tanks to your dispensers. Got up those on either side of the of, uh, of the tanks in this location here, um, and then uh, also you've got your vents uh, with gasoline. It's got to be at least 12 feet above uh, above grade, um, and then you've got the monitoring systems and components to control that, and then uh, make sure that both the tanks and the piping and all the connections um, don't leak, or if they do, that, that you have some notification that uh, you have a problem from those components. All right, now we talk about regulated and non-regulated. Here's some things that are tanks that are not regulated as underground storage tanks in Pennsylvania. First thing you're looking at is a farm or a residential tank that you have motor oil, you're storing it on site for your own use. Um, you're filling up your own vehicles. It could be at a farm, it could be a tractor, your own car, you're not selling it. You're just using it on for your own stuff. So you could have a, you know, a thousand gallon underground tank for gasoline and you're using it for yourself. It's not regulated. The biggest one you're probably dealing with uh, as far as non-regulated ones are heating oil. Basically, if you have a heating oil underground tank and you're using it on the premises and you're not selling it, then it's not regulated. So, and there's no size requirement on that. Uh, there used to be in the past, back in the 90s, but they changed that. Now there's no size uh, constraint on that issue. It's as long as you're using it on the premises for heating, you're okay. Um, other item here I want to mention is um, like tanks that are a part of a flow through or process system, something like an oil water separator, like going from you know taking in a flow and then separating oil and then holding a tank. Uh, and then discharging out the the back end of the separator, that that's not a that's not a regulated tank. It's a process system. So that's where manufacturing processes are a little bit different um, as far as the regulated for underground storage tank. And finally, sumps, any sumps that are you know used both commercially or or, or privately that hold water for uh, you know for basically for an overflow or for a limited amount of time, and they empty them. Uh, shortly thereafter, they're not considered to be regulated. So there are a lot of tanks that are out there that you might come across then or that are not regulated. So that's that could be a, that's something you, you're going to see. And these are the main areas that uh, we're looking at as far as uh, the non-regulated areas, a lot of them in the farm and a lot of them for heating oil, both for private and, and commercial that are utilized uh, for fueling uh, for fuel on uh, on the property. And there is other differences between regulated and non-regulated uh, uh, USTs in Pennsylvania. Basically, it's about the information that's available. Uh, how can you find out or access it? Regulated uh, USTs, there's a lot of information and we'll go through some of that in, uh, in, uh, later on in the, in the uh, presentation here. The data the DP uh, requires to be uh, maintained and, and, and documented as far as the systems. There's a lot that you can get from DEP. There's database information out there that you can access. Um, you can access it online. 
give you some basic information about it. That's if you run into regulated UST. Non-regulated ones, DP probably doesn't have much of that at all. So you're a lot of restricted. You basically have to go back into some property inf information, property owners, uh, leases, or people that have or use the, the, the property or the tanks. They may have it, but a lot of times, you know, sometimes the municipalities have it, sometimes they don't. So uh, when you're dealing with non-regulated USTs, it can be very questionable or, or very uh, uh, uncertain about even when they were installed, what they were made of, and how big they are until you actually may have to pull them out of the ground. So, um, quick overview of when you have a regulated USTs, here's some of the items that you're going to have to follow and meet uh, as far as the DP requirements. First thing, a big one at the top of the list is, of course, checking for leaks. And that's not just uh, the tanks, it's the tanks and the piping. The DP considers each one of those areas a separate thing that have to be monitored and checked with sometimes the same method, but sometimes different. Um, but that, and that has to be documented monthly and uh, an inspector will look at the past year's worth of information. Um, then the other thing is any uh, equipment or techni techniques or technology that's being used to check it, uh, the tech check for leaks has to be checked or checked, uh, monitored and tested annually. So that's a new requirement that they've just started putting in here with the new regulations. Corrosion, you've got to check and make sure that the tanks are not falling apart. Um, that's done and there's a standard they have to meet and has to be done every three years. Uh, some new requirements that have to be done every three years are overfill and spill protection. Um, they have to actually test them to make sure that they do what they're supposed to do. They're, the spill buckets hold and don't have any leaks in them. The overfill, uh, either alarm or the valve, cuts off at the right percentage so it doesn't allow for the overfill to happen. So those are new ones. Another new ones for regulated ones uh, is bold here is walkthrough inspections. Um, that is a new thing. It's not a big item to do. Um, it has to be done at least monthly, looking at your spill buckets and if you have a monitor just to make sure it's working and don't have any alarms or issues with that. And then annually, you might have to pull and look at your big sumps if you have sumps above your, your tanks. Um, that's a new thing. There's training. You have a certain uh, training has to be done for a highly high trained person and lesser trained people on your, at your facility. Of course, you have to pay a fee to register your tank with the DEP. And finally, then um, you have to have insurance coverage, uh, which is state required um, for underground storage tanks that are regulated. You have to be part of the underground storage tank indemnification fund, which is through the Department of Insurance. You get at least an annual fee for that. Um, and and also, the if you you're selling or whatever, you probably have a through through, through fill uh, fee. But a lot of times where that gets put in is when you get fuel delivered to your facility, that usually gets tucked into a cost that the supplier is going to bill you for that. So a lot of times you don't even know you're paying that. But those fees are basically to cover any releases from uh, your systems and also to do any investigations and cleanups of those releases over time. Uh, the basic uh, insurance coverage is for a one to six tank system, you have a $5,000 deductible. After you pay that, then you have insurance coverage for your system up to a million and a half dollars through the insurance fund. So if you're a regulated tank sit, uh, owner, you're gonna have to be part of that, but it, that's a, it's a good system and it's a good way to, to uh, cover for releases uh, that the state has set up. And finally on this, the, the end here is, uh, if you put if you are putting in or installing new systems right now, they are all required to be double walled tanks, piping, and containment basins around all of those systems to make sure that there isn't any leaks. It's gotta be done by the certified person. And also, um, uh, you have an option, there is no requirement. It, it doesn't have to be steel, it doesn't have to be fiberglass, it, it could be either one, but it does have to be double walled. And here's a brief example of an underground storage tank system. Uh, you've got a, the tank itself, 
you've got the piping, your pump coming up from it, going to a dispenser. Um, you've got a, a level probe to monitor the level of fuel in the tank. You have on the left, on you have an overfill uh, device that uh, shows the, uh, the where the flat valve is, where it would cut off for overfilling. You have a you may have a tank monitor, which in this case it looks like it's an automatic tank gauge that's uh, checking or, or testing your tank over time. Um, and then you also have some sensors in your sumps and underneath your dispenser to make sure if you have any leaks there and also one in between the double walls of the tank. If there's any issues uh, from the inner tank leaking, you get catch that before it goes into the, uh, into the environment. Um, so that's once you've got your system, then you're operating. Um, and over time, you're going to have to have what they call facility operations inspections or FOIs done. Um, there's got to be one done initially after you install the tank. There'll be one done at least every three years after that. And then there's also one uh, after the sale of the, the facility or the, the system to another, another owner. Um, and of course, DP could do it whenever uh, they want to come in and do an inspection, but they don't do that very often unless there's some uh, incidents or, or concerns at a facility. Now, the other thing is UST uh, inspections are generally done um, uh, and sent out by DEP to be done by third-party certified inspectors. So it's not the DEP generally coming out to do them. It's a certified person, uh, industry and consultant like myself, that goes out and does the inspection. Um, and the inspectors can be very, uh, I know my uh, philosophy is I'm out there to try to help you, uh, help the, uh, you know, the tank owner to make sure that they become compliant and try to educate them and get them up to speed and do what we can to, to get them to meet the requirements. Now this page, um, I know there's a lot of stuff on here. Um, this is the cover page of the inspection report um, for the regulated tanks. Um, and it's a summary, and there's a lot of items in the middle and the, uh, the blocks there. Those are the items, which is actually 14 of them, that are required to be uh, either have to be, you have to be either be compliant or or, fall, or meet the requirements of the DP regulations. You can see they vary from a lot of testing, a lot of leak detection is in there. There's some administrative things like you know just displaying your registration certificate. Um, there's a financial responsibility item in there. That's the uh, underground insurance uh, fund, making sure you're paying that. Inspections and training is in there. So there's a lot of different things. And this is basically doubled since the last cycle of inspections that happened with the new regulations that have gone into effect uh, in 2018. So there's a lot of things on that. That And so there's a lot of new uh, ownership tank owners that are having or are getting you know, educated that a lot of the stuff they have to do now that they haven't done it before in the past. Um, and so there's a lot of questions and a lot of things that are that are being, uh, you know, updated or revised or changed at this time. So I'll send you, I'm going to show you one more page and this is just, there's a lot of information here. This is a summary page of all the information that the state generally wants on your tanks when the inspection done is done. Um, you're asking about size of the tanks, when they were installed, what kind of material they're made of, are they single double wall, um, how your dispensers, you have uh, sumps above the tanks, you have vapor uh, recovery systems in there, how you're testing for your, your leak detection uh, with your tank and your piping. Um, so there's a lot of stuff on here, so I won't go into that excessively too far here, but um, just to let, let you know, that's You've seen the first two pages of this report. There's there's seven more pages after this, which go into the seven different tank methods you can use and the five different piping methods that you can use for leak detection and just more of the administrative thing. So it, it's a lot of uh, a lot of paper and uh, it can be a little bit overwhelming. But, uh, but anyways, uh, just want to give you a brief outlook of some of the stuff that if you're regulated, you have to be dealing with. So. So eventually, you know, probably most tanks are gonna have to be closed or removed um, either because of age or different change in use or, or change in operations. Um, and regulated systems basically have three options. Um, you can do a temporary out of service closure, which is for three years. 
basically you empty the tank, um, you still maintain all the other systems in there, um, like corrosion and, and, and overfilling and everything else is, is, is essentially static, but you, you don't use it. And after that three year period though, you either have to put it back into service or you have to have it removed. And the DP was a little um, light or not as attention to detail on that in the past, but now they're starting to get holding people to the three year time frame pretty closely. So, um, so it gives you a breathing room to decide if you wanna put them back into service or not, or pull them out. But you basically just have three years at that point. Of course, the other option is if you know, hey, I'm going to take it out, I'm either going to not going to do this anymore with underground tanks or if I'm going to put in a new system, um, you can have it removed. So that's a, a picture at the bottom there. They're actually removing that tank. The third option, which DP generally doesn't like, um, and, you, and you have to do an assessment of the tank area uh, even if you're going to do this, which is closing the tanks in place, which is basically you cleaning them out and then filling them up with inert material. But before you do that, generally, what you have to do is assess the area, just like if you're doing for a closure um, around and underneath the storage tank to make sure that you know there's no any uh, contamination. Once you verify that, then you would go and close in place. Um, usually, there's issues with tanks. Underground tanks may be being located inside buildings or industrial areas or where there's <clears throat> safety or stability issues. And a lot of times it, you know, uh, it may require a, a PE to uh, <clears throat> to sign off on or uh, to cover or to uh, verify that there's some issues that DEP will accept a closure in place. But, but um, as far as closures, um, if it's a regulated tank, you have to do a closure with a, with a a certified tank, uh, a remover. If it's a not regulated tank, that's not required. Um, so you, you've got some flexibility there. Um, if, if you have a, a heating oil tank, it's, you know, if you want to remove it. One thing I will say though about removing an unregulated tank, if you actually physically remove it and you find evidence of contamination, technically that's supposed to be reported to the DEP and there's issues with that. So, but with any closure, um, uh, but particularly, definitely with a regulated one, you've got to have to take some samples, soils, and water if you hit the if you run into water, and then you've got to report the documentation of those the sample results to the DEP. Um, and in this case, uh, you've got a little issue with uh, some leakage coming out of the tank. So yeah, um, if you do have evidence of contamination, you do, do need to notify the DEP. Um, and um, then you, you basically fall into the, the uh, regulatory uh, investigation and uh, assessment uh, guidance that you would if, uh, if the tank was, uh, if the tank's regulated or even if it's not regulated. So, um, now I'm gonna co cover a couple of projects that we've dealt with in the past. Um, first couple here are basically ones that were heating oil tanks. Um, here's a facility that, that had a very large heating oil tank that was uh, used to heat their greenhouses. Um, and um, there was a change in the ownership of the, of the facility, which required a, a phase two to be done that the bank required. Um, they found some impacts to groundwater. And then there was an evaluation done what options that were possible with were dealing with the heating oil tank. One, it had to be removed. Um, so, the determination was, should it be replaced um, with an underground tank? Should we put in an above ground tank possibly? Or could you uh, use another, remove the tank and use another fuel source? Um, and actually the, the other fuel source is what ended up happening here. So um, this is the facility or the area where this underground storage tank is. You see the building on the right and the fence on the left. Uh, the tank is located in between, you know, lengthwise in, in there. Um, and uh, there's not a lot of space. So um, putting in a new above ground tank really wasn't an option. Plus it was gonna be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, probably um, close to $200,000 to do that for that size of a tank. So the option uh, determination was made to pull it out and 
there's a the, the, the tank being removed. Um, it's using a crane in this aspect. And it was decided uh, they already had a gas line already uh, to the facility. They ended up expanding it and going that option as far as um, how they're going to be fueling. But uh, there's a case where a heating oil tank was not replaced. It was uh, a different uh, fuel source was going to be used. Oh, there you go. Uh, next uh, project or example uh, site I want to go over is a uh, is a location where they were selling a, f a farm in uh, in Marietta. Um, they had a small heating oil tank uh, that was used to heat this farm house, um, and uh, the tank one you know, needed to be removed prior to the sale of the property, and it was done at a very quick turnaround. Um, it needed to be done in a couple of weeks, so we arranged for a contractor to remove the tank. We had the same samples of the soils analyzed, and um, and we did the closure report, and submitted that. To, to the uh, to the financial and the ownership and the and the, the buyer and the seller. Um, in this case, it's a you know, not regulated tank, but we follow regulated procedures just like it was, just to make sure everything was above board. Plus, it gives both the buyer and seller the documentation they need to verify that there wasn't any or was any issues as far as the release from the tank system. Here's pictures of that location. Uh, the Picture on the left is where the tank was located. Uh, you can see the fill point in the middle, middle of the picture there. Um, and the tank on, on the picture on the right is the tank that was actually removed. A um, little bit of corrosion, but no holes. And the samples came back fine. There's no evidence of, of uh, contamination, both in the analytical or the visual. So um, this was done, and then uh, and the project and the CLO. Uh, commenced and was completed. And then finally, uh, we do get into situations where uh, we've got projects where people are looking to buy properties or and uh, have tanks. And here's a site uh, in uh, Tyrone where we had a couple of, uh, well, there was operating a, a several uh, underground storage tanks and um, a different owner, um, the owner wanted to sell it, and a, different, a buyer said, "Well, let me uh, do an assessment beforehand to see whether there's any issues." Or, and so we found some impacts with the groundwater, uh, and then there, we evaluated options of what he could do, depending on either he installed new tanks at the site um, to replace the ones that look to be have an issue. Um, how was there going to be issue with remediating the the, the, the groundwater, the impacts that were found. So that's a case where you're not physically doing work, you're doing an assessment uh, of the area and determining whether a buyer uh, a sell, sale could happen. Um, and then finally, um, here's just a couple pictures of the facility, uh, it's a convenience store with, with fueling. So a lot of these are around, um, and a lot of them had problems in the past. Um, one thing you can find out with regulated tanks um, is that you, there is a history, and a lot of times you can't get the background information from the DEP about um, whether there was a release, if there was, what was involved, uh, how long did it take, uh, is it still pending, has it closed out, um, if there is still some pending restrictions as far as like on a, a deed restriction or an environmental covenant which restricts the use of the property because of the contamination. And a lot of that with regulated tenants you can find out fairly easily, so uh, with the DP database and file reviews. So, um, that pretty much covers um, the cycle of tanks that I was going to cover. Uh, here's just a couple of pictures. The site on the left is where the, the tanks were beforehand, and the, tanks, uh, the picture on the right is the tanks where uh, they're being removed and they're being vented out to, to be removed. Uh, they were gasoline tanks, so they were definitely had some uh, vapor issues there. So. Um, that pretty much concludes my uh, presentation. Um, there's my contact information there. Uh, so, Ted, um, I don't know how many questions we've had. Uh, if you want to kind of go over that. <clears throat> yeah, uh, thank, thank you, Frank. Thank you for the presentation. And I know we had some people that joined um, after we kicked off. So just a, a reminder, if you do have questions, you can, you're on mute, but you can type them in to go to webinar and I can, uh, We'll kind of go through them now. So um, we did have one that came in within the 
the first 10 minutes of your presentation, Frank. Um, uh, the one slide essentially noted 110 gallons, and then the other slide noted um, 1,100 gallons. Um, I think there might be a difference there, but can you, I guess the question is, was that by error or was that intentional? No, the, by regulation, it's, it's, they say it's 110 gallons, but uh, the 1,100 gallons I was, was being for use for your individual use on a facility. Um, so you can have like a 500 gallon tank, but if you're using it for commercial purposes, um, it might be regulated, but if you have a thousand gallon tank, if you're using it for heating oil or gasoline in your own facility, um, it, it might not be regulated. It's just that you could have a tank as small as 110 gallons and still be regulated. It's possible. So uh, it just, you got into a different category when you get to the 1100 gallon quantity. Yep. That makes, that makes sense. So you know, there, there is a differential. Uh, right. Obviously, they, they do look similar, but there is a differential. Um, uh, 110 Inside. is the minimum, and then 1,100, depending on the usage, is the threshold for um, uh, for non-regulated. So, um, we actually did not get anything else in here, Frank. So I'm going to give it a couple of minutes uh, or 30 seconds before we wrap up or uh, do anything else here to let anyone submit something that may come in. But again, Frank, you did include your contact information there. Um, right. Uh, my, okay, my we, just had a, we just had a follow-up. Yeah, yeah. So the question, Frank, so a commercial tank must be regulated if over 110 gallons. Um, that, that's the question. It has the potential, right. You, you, you can be as low as 110 gallons and still be uh, and still be potentially regulated. So if you have a 100 gallon tank, it doesn't matter what it is, it's too small, you're never gonna be regulated. So, but if you get to 110 gallons, you always, you always have the possibility that you could be a, could be in a regulated situation, but then you've gotta look at the particulars. Um, and that's where you can get, yeah, I've got a th thousand gallon underground tank in my front yard, um, I'm a, but I'm using it just for fueling my, my furnace, yeah, it's above 110, but for because of your use and what you're doing and you're not selling it, it's not regulated. So that's you, that's where the, the additional details, uh, you have to look at to the side. But if you have something less than 110, you're never going to be in a regulated situation. Got it. Makes sense. And, and, and I think some of the scenarios about that could come down to on-site consumption purposes. Uh, so on and so on. So, okay, that, that makes sense. Can you expand on the annual leak testing, single wall piping versus double wall and types of leak, de leak detection? Um, annual testing is required for any method that you're using for your leak detection, for your tanks and your piping. So a tank service company basically has to has to check your if you depending on your method. I mean, there's there's different methods. There's if you have a double wall system, it could be interstitial monitoring between the walls. Um, you could have an automatic tank gauge for your tank. That's another method um, that's available. Um, technically, you can still use groundwater and vapor monitoring, but very rarely you have seen any of those being used. Um, that, that's sampling wells and sampling va and vapor wells to verify that you're not leaking. I, I think there's probably just a handful of those in the whole state if there are any more. Um, there's also a method called statistical inventory reconciliation, which you send all your, your data, what you've been delivered, how you're dispensing it, send all that to a third party, and then they do a essentially a, an analysis of the of what's going on to determine whether you have a leak or not. Um, it, it's a it, it it divides the cost, but it there's you still have to have a certain amount of monitoring and data coming in to be able to provide them. So there's a few of those that are out there that do that, but there's not many. Um, most people are doing either automatic tank gauges or they're doing double wall interstitial monitoring. Um, 
Now with piping, you can have line testing done on an annual basis. That's an that's a acceptable method. Uh, but of course, um, uh, that has to be also checked annually, so that kind of goes together. Uh, plus, you have you can also have mechanical and electric line leak detection methods, which are devices that are on your lines to determine whether you potentially have a a loss of pressure because they're those are designed for pressurized systems. And something to mention: a pressurized system is where the the pump that pumps the fuel is located essentially on top of the tank, um, and usually in a sump area where you can it's accessible, so it pushes the the product from the tank to your dispensers um, up the up the piping. Um, so line leak detectors are used in that case. Now there's you can also have suction systems, which you have the pump at your dispenser, which sucks the fuel from the tank and then brings it up to your dispenser that way. Um, now with that kind of a system, you can use double wall piping, but you can also there's a met there's a method called a European suction or exempt system, which allows you basically to put a check valve at the at the dispenser. Um, and then if the suction goes off, all the fuel then just goes right back into the tank that it doesn't stay in the piping. So that's an, actually an acceptable exempt piping uh, leak detection method that the DP allows. But but either a suction or a pressure system, you're gonna have, you know different methods to check for your piping. Um, and, it, and it could be with, could be interstitial if you have two walls, but it also could be either line leak detectors or um, could be an exempt system with the appropriate check valve in, in the, uh, underneath the dispenser. So um, explaining all those different methods real briefly, um, that's why there's, you know, eight pages, nine pages of the inspection report because they're all listed on there and you either mark them as, yeah, you're, you're doing that method or you skip over it. So um, so there's a lot of detail and, uh, and, and there's definitely a lot of options about what how you can do things um, both for your piping and your tanks as far as leak detection. So those some either with existing systems or with upgrading or even new systems, you have some choices there. So there's some flexibility and DP allows you that as long as you, you know, meet the basic requirements for each one of those methods. Thank you, Frank. I, I have a connected question from another individual on, on what you just expanded on. So regarding non-regulated underground tanks, are mm -hmm. you saying, are you saying an act 100 single wall now needs to be double wall? No, no. I mean, if it's an existing tank system, it's grandfathered in. Okay. Yeah. It, okay. I mean, if it's a new system, then it has to be double wall. But gotcha. Right. So if that if you have an Act 100 single wall, and if it's it's it was in before the effective date of those regulations, which I think was somewhere 2007 2008. That the double wall regulations went into effect, um, you're good. You're good. You're grandfathered in. But if you would replace or have to upgrade or put in new tanks, then you'd have to go to a full double wall tank system at that point. So, understood. The the to the individual that asked that, if you have any follow up questions, you just if you want to email me, I, I can put you in touch with Frank offline on on that one. Um, uh, another question we got, are you aware of any labor and industry L&I regulations that, that need to be followed for, for non-regulated tanks? So aside from a DEP regulation, are you, are you aware of any L&I regulations? There are L&I regulations um, and there, there could be some regulations for non-regulated tanks that L&I has. Um, I'd have to go back and look at those. Um, I know for large systems, yes, they 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 have a permit requirement. Um, they handle things now, uh, as in the past. Way in the past, it used to be the state police fire marshal, but now it's labor and industry. Um, you, you almost have to 
to check and see if they're uh, with the labor and industry because they their regulations don't quite match up with the same regulated requirements that the DP has. So um, they run their own little ship. Um, a lot of times they do overlap, especially with the larger size tanks, but the smaller ones in usage, sometimes you got to check. Uh, labor and industry has some, definitely some, some individual requirements that you have to look at both on underground and above ground tanks. Um, there's some restrictions there you, you have to either comply with or get variances with. So you, you almost have to, to look at them separately as far as labor and industry uh, of, of regulation. So that's, um, that's a whole other area which it, it's, if you're getting into that, then, then, then yeah, that, that could be a, a lot of uh, investigation and, and understanding with, with labor and industry sometimes. Yeah, I, I think, and again, the person that, that asked that question, if you want to email me, uh, you know, from an association perspective, we, we regularly, regularly con communicate with Helen and I and have a pretty good um, open door there. I'm sure Frank does as well. So I, if you have a specific question on that um, and you right. want an answer on it, send me an email and it, we'll, do a, we'll do our best to get you some clarification. Right. Go well, ahead. Uh, no, yeah, if there's if anybody has any concerns or questions or, or issues, uh, you know, be free to email them or, or call me up. Uh, you know, definitely willing to help anybody out to understand what's going on to try to point you in the right direction uh, to refer you or, or even to do some coordination with maybe even the regulatory people. Because I do have some connections with, with those people being on the storage tank advisory committee. And uh, we at Lehman also deal with the investigation and remediation of, of leaking tanks. So we get, we get to deal with those people on the DEP side and in the environmental cleanup side. So uh, if you do have any of those those issues, uh, we'd definitely be willing to help you out, uh, you know, and try to give a, you some advice and recommendations. So. Yeah, appreciate that, Frank. Um, we did get one general question. Will the slides be available for download? And the answer is yes. We will be sending a replay of the, um, excuse me, a replay of the webinar recording um, for anyone that was on here today automatically. I, you'll get it tomorrow morning at, I think, 9 a.m. And then uh, we send me an email for any requests for the PDF. We'll, we'll get you a copy of that separately uh, for anyone that's interested in, uh, in in Frank's presentation today. And he's, he's already graciously uh, agreed to being willing to share that. Sure, definitely. <clears throat> okay, um, got a couple good questions here. I appreciate everyone that that um, that that asked questions, and I think the interaction part of this is is uh, is valuable. So, uh, seeing no other questions, Frank, at this point, I think we're going to wrap up, and really appreciate your your time this morning and your expertise on the topic, and uh, anything. Anything you want to touch on? Actually, Frank, I have a question. Uh, and not to put you on the spot, I didn't get a chance to talk to you about this. Can you comment at all on, on, on the stage two changes that are going to be taking effect this year for our, our gasoline uh, members? Um, I've seen a little bit of them, and we actually haven't, they haven't really covered much of them on the, in the stack committee, but for what I've seen, I guess okay. all right. they're, they're, at this point, from what I've seen, they're, basically going to take them away or make them go away. So um, they're, we're getting out of the stage two business essentially at this point. So um, there won't be any requirement for that in the future. And any existing systems will essentially be, you know, decommissioned or inactivated. So um, we'll just only have, there's just a stage one, stage two should be going away. Okay. Yeah. I think there's more to come on that. I just didn't know. You know, with the, I think that's gonna be finally coming down the pike here this year with uh, with the regul the regulatory process being finalized. So anyway, more details to come from an association side on on that. Um, and uh, Frank, before we wrap up, any any closing comments on your end? No, but just uh, I will make uh, one comment about stage two. Um, the uh, the next uh, stack committee meeting is actually next week. So uh, I will raise that issue with them because uh, I haven't heard and see if, see what uh, feedback I can get, and then I'll provide that to to you, uh, Ted, and, and to anybody that, that's interested. 
Yeah, that'd be great. I think it just passed through ERC, um, like within right. the last 30 days, and I would assume and it's going to be published here pretty soon. So, um, anyway, okay, I, yeah, I appreciate that, and I'll give uh, Mike the Burdine, who's our our seat on the on the stack um, committee, a heads up on that as well. Um, but uh, thank you very much again, Frank. Really appreciate it. Thank you everyone that that joined us this morning and and, and stuck through the, the the question part of this, and I uh, hope everyone has a great great rest of the day, and we will. Again, do our next webinar the first Tuesday of, of in April, which I think is April 5th. So I uh, hope to see you all back next month. And uh, again, have a great, great day, great week, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you. Take care. Take care.